right. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. How are y'all today? Thank you for being here today. Let me let you know that last week we were gone down to Brownsville and we had the opportunity to hand out all the shirts, the hats that this church graciously let us take down there. And when we were arrived there, the church said we didn't have any left. So everything our church was able to supply, that helped one whole afternoon to hand out to everybody. So I wanted to tell you all what a great work you did as a church. And you were represented down there very, very nicely. It was great to watch them love having a hat, having a new shirt or a U-shirt. You thought it was Christmas for all of them. And our church provided that. So God bless you all for that. And so now we get to start up in the baptismal waters. Amen. Brother Jeff. Amen. Thank y'all. Good morning. We have a special occasion today for me, uh, but I want us to teach us, remind us how to celebrate. Uh, I want to thank all the OU fans for filling up the baptistry this morning. (laughs) We really appreciate that. Uh, It's nice and warm, so thank y'all. But every time we go to a football or watch football games, they're over. We're going to do that this morning. When this man comes up out of the water, I want us to celebrate. Don't be shy. If the angels in heaven are celebrating, let's compete against them. Okay? Can we do it? Y'all want to practice? Sounds good. This, this gentleman, Eddie, Eddie, Eddie Munoz, is a result of a 4x4 four four challenge. Uh, that's what today's about. And so Craig Berenzen is a neighbor of Craig's, and our 4 before is we invite, we invest, we identify, and we intercede. And that's, what, that's what Craig has done. He walked across the street to invite a neighbor. And so here he is today to be baptized. Eddie's got a beautiful testimony, uh, and I'll share this with you. Uh, he came, Craig brought him, he came a couple of days or so later, Bill and I invited him out to eat. His first word said, I know what y'all want. (laughs) He said, but I'm going to read the Bible for myself. I'm going to let it be the one that decides what I do. So he texted me uh, probably around, best that we can tell, it just happened to be on my birthday, July 22nd, that that he made this decision to follow Christ. So a few days later, he, he, I texted him, he, or he texted me again. He said, I, I want to talk to you about being baptized. So I met with him, went over that. He likes to read for himself, so I gave him some materials to read, explained it. A few days later, I said, you have any questions? He said, no, I'm all in. Yeah. Uh, so that's, that's Eddie's testimony. <clears throat> Come on down. Now, any pastors here understand this, this is a rare occasion when an older gentleman decides to follow Christ. I mean, it's it's a huge testimony. Huge. So let's don't take it for granted. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Today, we have that opportunity. Come on. Eddie, I baptize you, my friend, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Buried with him, raised to walk in the news and life. Thank y'all. All right, let's stand together. Behold, he comes riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. Sing that. Days of 
Amen. I love our beautiful church family. Thank you for <laughs> lifting up your voice and celebrating and praising our blessed Lord. You know, the Bible says that God inhabits the praise of his people. You have just invited him to take over today. Amen. I want to do a couple things. Number one, I want to welcome our guests. If you are a guest, you are an answer to our prayer. We pray Amen. faithfully that God will send guests to us. So you're an answer to prayer. That's a great blessing by itself. Thank you for being here. We want to know about you. If you'll find a guest card and let us have information about you, whatever you care to share, there's wooden boxes around the exterior of the building. You can place them in there, or Mike and Kim will be right outside those doors, and we have a gift for you if you're a guest. We'd like to give that to you, and that will help us connect with you. We just want you to know that not only does God love you, but we love you, and Amen. you're a big deal. We'd love to have you. But I'm glad to have Dr. Tom and Diane, Lord, bless you for being here. Uh, Brother Tom spoke at our man's rally last night. It was a wonderful time Amen. together. Brother Tom is preaching today. God bless you, brother. Amen. I told some of our guests, uh, you come on the right Sunday. We got a great preacher today. Amen. <laughs> it's perfect. And uh, Brother Tom, I know you have a message to the Lord. Following uh, the, the, the message and the service that we're going to have uh, lunch together. It's it's a uh, chili cook-off and cobbler, whatever it is, bake-off. Brother, come tell us about it, brother. All right, thanks. All right, we got it. And just so you'll know, after the service, head across to the gym, go through the brown door, and then there'll be chili set up around the wall. So just go and find whatever chili you want. Uh, cobblers are over there somewhere. Rhonda's taking care of that because she's the best. Um, and I had something else. Oh, your children. 
first through sixth grade are going to be eating about 11.15 and then they're going to be playing. If you have a preschooler, you got to get them though. So make sure you get your preschooler and take them and eat with you. But now for the moment that you've been waiting for, we have our, you know, this is our third time to do the chili cook-off. And we had some judges, there are black eyes, there are bloody noses, because it was a very, very close decision. But for our third time, we now have a two-time winner. And the winner is... Patty Luttrell. Okay, well, Patty will come get her shirt here in a minute. All right. Oh, and hers is chili number three. All right. Cobbler. This is the first time we've done a cobbler bake-off. And the winner is... Rhonda Oakley, which she's over in the other building. So, and her cobbler is number four. So it's a pecan cobbler and looks pretty dead gum good. <laughs> And I wasn't even hungry until I walked over there this morning. I've been starving ever since. But I'm more hungry for the Word of God. Inside your worship, God, is serious. Now I'll pull it back just a moment. Uh, next week we're taking a special offering for our Great Commandment ministry. That will just uh, inform you about how that's, why it's important. Pray about it this week and see what God will do about helping us have a wonderful offering to help us do that. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for the day that you have given us. This is your day, Lord. We, we celebrate in it the resurrection of Jesus Christ, Lord. We just thank you so much that we serve a risen Lord. And we're, we're grateful, Lord, we have the privilege to come again and celebrate this uh, again on this day. I pray, Lord, you continue now as we praise you, Lord. Lift, let us lift up our voices. Let us uh, exalt your name, Lord. I pray that... Uh, you would prepare our hearts for the message that I know that you have gotten for us from uh, Brother Tom. And uh, I thank you for him being here, Lord. I pray you would use him uh, again this morning, uh, that you might be uh, exalted, that our hearts might be open to hear what you've said. And then, Lord, give us, the, give us Lord, the will to make the decisions that we need to make today. In Jesus' strong and mighty name. Amen. Amen. Kevin, are you sure you tasted all of them? Because mine was number 21. I opened up t two cans of Wolf Brand chili and stuck it in there. <laughs> Thought for sure that would win. Justice 
to hear y'all sing. Matter of fact, I want to hear you sing. Ready? All by yourself. Amazing Sing it. Our 
Gotta do the last verse now. Ready? When we been there ten thousand years, bright shining <laughs> as the Is that not beautiful? We need to make a live album, what do you think? <laughs> Listen to this. calling my name My God is so much bigger than the troubles I face Amen Why would I hunger for power of riches or Sing with me.
my righteousness. Oh God, how I need you. Amen. Let's give our Father a hand. Thank you, choir. Thank you, praise team. Brother Tom. Well, these are tears in my eyes. I am <clears throat> I'm humbled to be here. And each time God has allowed Diana and me to come and share with you, there's, there's been something different about the church. But I'll just tell you, I turned, turned to Brother Charlie and I said, it seems the Lord has just decided to come and tabernacle here. And um, I went home, back, I started to say home. Motels can become your home. I, I went last night uh, and said to I, and I said, that's about as perfect a men's meeting as you could ever have. And to end that with all these men at the altar, Praying, praying, and I think that's the, that's the answer. And I did learn a few new songs last night. I asked if I could have them on a CD, and I was told I could not. <laughs> and so I'm a little pooch mouth about that this morning, if you just want to know the truth. And anyway, it is a delight for us to be here. Diane and I are always humbled when we have this privilege. Brother Charlie, thank you. And I know I was number three. Was it number three? You said number three. <laughs> and they introduced me last night with a roast. <laughs> you know, you're coming to help them out. And you get roasted. That was, uh, that was unusual. But thank God for His presence in this place. We're grateful. Would you do this? Would you take the Bible, or I don't know if you have the Bible. I hope, you know, that's a good thing. If you've got one, uh, bring it to the service. But uh, if not, use your computer, your cell phone. I doubt you brought your computer. But uh, use your cell phone. And turn with me, if you will, please, to the 18th and the 19th chapters of Genesis. So many friends. I feel so comfortable and thank you again, Brother Charlie. Let me begin this morning before the reading of the Scripture by asking you a very serious question. Is there in your life between you and the Lord, some issue that you've been struggling with perhaps for some time, and it has yet to be settled. It may be an issue regarding a family member or a friend, a relationship issue. Those are tough issues. It may be an issue involving your physical health or strength. It may be an issue, and this is big, regarding your future. It could be a spiritual issue, some deep spiritual issue, and you realize that God, by His Holy Spirit, is speaking to your heart and asking for a change. You may even know what that change is supposed to be. But as of this morning in the service, that still is an unsettled issue. And God's waiting. And you know that. <clears throat> And you've thought about it, you've prayed about it. it. Perhaps there are moments when you're under conviction about it, and maybe there are moments when, when you almost forget it, but then it comes back. Oh, yes, there's that, that issue, and it has yet 
to be resolved. How many of us, in just sheer honesty this morning, would say, Brother Tom, that describes me here this morning. There is an, there's an issue. I, I know what it is, but I'll be honest enough to admit it is yet to be resolved. Would you raise your hand? You know, that's almost all of us. Yes, there's an issue in my life. It's yet to be resolved. <clears throat> now, this message this morning has a title. <laughs> the title is, is an urgent command. It is, settle it now. In light of what I want to call the truth about tomorrow. And, uh, excuse me, sweetheart or somebody bring me up. I'm an old man. I can't believe cried here and standing, sitting down here singing and crying. Thank you, sir. That's all I need. You can use the rest of them. <laughs> Pardon me. All right, that's so many of us here. And let me say to you that this altar is for you. That's what an altar is for. I go to some churches and they say, "Ah, oh, that's a beautiful altar, you know, and they look at flowers and all that. That's okay. But the purpose of an altar is not to be beautiful. It's a place to die. It's a place of sacrifice. And I want to urge you this morning to settle it now. Just give up to God. Surrender. Say yes to Him this morning. Genesis chapter 18 and 19 are two of the most significant passages of Scripture, chapters in the entire Bible. If you could get on a bus with Brother Charlie and travel to the Holy Land and drive down inside Jordan and on your way to Petra, well, you'd look off to, to, the, to the west from that bus down at the southern end of the Dead Sea. And there, out there in the plains, amidst all the rocks and the sands, are the remnants of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Two of the most wicked cities. In fact, they stand as an emblem of what being a wicked city ought to be. Even give rise to a term that describes an awful sexual sin typified by those cities and, and typified by so many in our nation today. It's interesting because <clears throat> very close to the surface you can also see archaeological evidence of a great physical event that occurred there. Somehow there was an eruption. There was, there was literally fire and brimstone and molten lava falling from the sky because of an eruption someplace, and it was so powerful that it landed in that area. The, the remnants are there. My goodness. And that area is the setting for some of the most significant events in the Old Testament. In Genesis chapter 18, we have uh, Abraham and Sarah camped uh, a distance from that area. Their nephew Lot is down in Sodom, living there with his family. But Abraham and Sarah living to the north, and the Lord comes to visit him. Literally, the Lord, a theophany. The Lord comes to visit. He has two angels with him. And I'll not go through the whole event because you have read it and you know it, but that's where the Lord said that Sarah, even in her old age, was going to have a baby. He was named Isaac because Sarah chuckled to herself, and that means laughter. And so every time she called his name, she was reminded that she chuckled when the Lord said that and even denied that she did, which you don't ever want to deny anything to the Lord. But can you imagine, how can this happen? And God went further to say, that baby 
is going to be my means of salvation to the ends of the earth. If you would read the genealogy, for instance, in the Gospel of Matthew, it starts right there and ends with Jesus. Yeah. <sighs> what an event. You need some time to go back and read that. But at the close of that chapter, you'll read that the Lord stood up having brought this announcement personally to Abraham, who was an old man. And he stood up and said, we're going to go down to Sodom and Gomorrah and see if it's as wicked as it seems to be. The cry of the wickedness of that city has come up to us. And so they started walking towards Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham moved around, however, and positioned himself in front of the Lord. And you can read all about this. And he begins to intercede. He says, Lord, if you find 50, that's all he could believe God for. Would you destroy it? No, I wouldn't for 50. How about 55? I wouldn't for 55. How about 40? I wouldn't for 40. 30? 20? 10? And when the Lord said, I wouldn't even destroy it for 10. If you can find 10 righteous, I would not destroy it. Well, Lot... And his family were there. He thought, surely there are ten who are righteous in that city. And when he secured that promise from God, he went back to his place of resting, his tent. The Lord went back to his in heaven, and the two angels made their way to Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, you remember the story. If not, take time to read it. Toward the evening, the angels showed up there in Sodom looking for Lot and his family, and, and uh, they were visitors, visiting men, and so they became prey for the wicked men of the city, and, and Lot begged him to come into the house. You, you remember the story. In fact, Lot made a concession with his daughters there that, that, that rose up to haunt him weeks later. And they said to him, listen, God's going to destroy this place. You need to know that. Lot even went to his future sons-in-law, begged them to get out of the city. And, you know, this will tell you something about his character. He seemed, the Scripture says, unto them as one who mocked. They thought he was kidding. Sure. <laughs> hey, come on now. You're joking with us. Then when the morning sun rose, you remember what happened? Those angels took Lot and his wife and his two daughters and said, hurry. Lot's arguing the whole way. Get out. We are going to destroy this place. And you remember what happened? They literally physically took them by the hand and drug them out with Lot arguing about where they were going to stay and save their lives except for one, Sarah, his wife, who looked back. And the Bible says later became a pillar of salt, which would be very common to think about that with the way the sediment flows in that area with salt. And then God rained fire and brimstone on Sodom. Not a person left alive. And the chapter closes, or that section of the chapter closes, with Abraham. You can imagine when he got up in the morning and looked down toward the plain and saw the smoke ascending and realized some great cataclysmic event has occurred. Did he go down there to check on Lot and find out about his family? No, he just went back to the spot where he could see his footprints in the sand and the Lord's. And he remembered his promise. And Abraham, the Bible says, remembered, or God remembered Abraham and spared Lot. Now, what does that have to do with what I ask you? I ask you to settle it. Virtue well over three-fourths of this congregation 
And I know it's because God's here. Hey, raise your hand and say, there's an issue. I know what the issue is. It is not settled yet in my life. It hasn't, tra- I, I know what that issue is. I want to urge you to settle it now. In light of the truth about tomorrow. And with your Bible open, I want to tell you three things about tomorrow which you may never have considered. Are you ready? First of all, you need to settle it. Because the truth about tomorrow is that some people here are going to awaken to discover that their days of opportunity are over. I mean, go with me. Look, look with me at verses 23 through 25. The sun had risen over the earth when Lot came to Zohar. The Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah, brimstone, fire from the Lord out of heaven. He overthrew those cities and all the valley and all the inhabitants of the cities and what grew on the ground. I mean, he was devastated. And his wife, from behind, even, even Sarah, look back. She became a pillar. She died. She became a pillar of salt, the Scripture says. Look at that. Here, you can just, just walk among them. Here's the smoke, the devastation, the bodies charred and burned and mashed by objects falling from the sky. Look, these are people who ignored God's preacher. They ignored the pleading of God. They ignored the plan of God. And when the sun came up the next morning, their days of opportunity were over. Now, I'm not going to park here very long, but I just want to tell you, you're making a pretty big assumption when you say, I'll settle that tomorrow. You have no guarantee of tomorrow. It might not be Sodom and Gomorrah. It might be an intersection. But you have no promise. You have no guarantee. That opportunity may be lost. Maybe when you raised your hand, you were saying, well, it's a person, and I want... Listen... It could be that that person is lost to you forever. You are going to say, are are you so presumptuous that you think that God is obligated to keep on convicting you of sin? He might just stop convincing you that wrong's wrong and let you live the life you want. That's why the Bible says, seek ye the Lord while he may be found. You don't come to God on your terms. You come to him on his terms. You're not his God. He's your God. Settle it now. Why? Because the truth about tomorrow is that some are going to discover that their days of opportunity are over. Now, this, I don't want to make this long. Let me mention a second thing here. And that is that some people, like Abraham, will discover that your prayers have been answered. You're about to quit. You're about to give up. You haven't resolved that issue. Well, look at Abraham. He discovered the next day that his prayers the day before were answered. Verse 27, Abraham arose early in the morning. All of these happened the next day. Arose early in the morning, went to the place where he had stood before the Lord, looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah, toward the land of the valley. He saw, and behold, the smoke of the land ascended like the smoke of a furnace. But it came about that when God destroyed the cities of the valley, that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow. I know some of you mamas and daddies and grandmothers and granddads, some of you husbands and wives and children and parents, you've been begging God and begging God. Diana and I feel like the the ministry God's called us to is to to pray, not just for our children and grandchildren. Well, that would be enough, our six kids and 33 grandkids and 13 great-grandkids and counting. I mean, that'd be enough. That'd keep us busy because we pray for them all by name, God willing, on a daily basis. And, and there's some 
for whom we are just crying out. One in particular. I am just begging God. And I am not going to give up. Because tomorrow, when the sun comes up, I may discover that God has answered that prayer. I was walking down the hallway of our church one day, and, and uh, uh, Henry Buxman came up to me. And, and, and let me just say that, that, in fact, there's a man here who was in that church at that time, that God was visiting us as he seems to be visiting you these days. And I was on my way to Deacon's meeting, and, and Henry walked up, and, and, and I, I'm free to use names here in this one, I can guarantee you. And he was a deacon. I loved Henry and Norman, and Norma, and they just, oh, they, uh, they love the Lord. And, and he said, Brother Tom, he said, I'm, I'm going to resign as a deacon tonight. I said, why? He said, I've got a daughter who's a hay, and I knew about that daughter, Donna. And he was right. And he says, I know what the Scripture says about the father, if he's going to be a leader in church, that he needs to be a leader of his family that's in his house. And he said, I, uh, it's bad. He resigned. Our deacon said, we'll pray for you and stay close to you in prayer. And they did. And I began to run into Henry and Norma in church on occasion. Well, how are you doing? How's Donna? And he would say this. He would say, up there or out there? And I said, what do you mean by that? He said, well, up there. He said, I'll just tell you the truth. God has given Norma and me a Bible promise. It's in Psalm 128 that says, one of these days our children are going to be gathered around the table like olive plants. And so we're just taking God at his word. Out there, it's bad, Brother Tom. She's left the house. She's living like the devil. Living with a guy, in fact. One time when I asked how uh, she was doing, he said, up there or out there? And I could see he was he just trembling to hang on to that. And he told me how up there they had that promise in Psalm 128. Out there, that daughter of, her, of theirs was pregnant. Out of wedlock, living with a guy. Just hanging on to that prayer. Hanging on to that promise. Then I discovered that her, from Henry, that her, her live-in boyfriend was in jail. Up there, out there. Not looking good out there, up there. God's given us a promise. What he didn't know God was about to do was he's about to send a member of our church who worked in that jail by to lead that boy to Christ which he did. And when he did, he called his girlfriend with that little baby and said, you got to go to your parents and your church, and you got to ask them to forgive you and restore fellowship to your family and to your church. And she said, how do I do that? He said, I don't know. Call Brother Tom. And so I got a phone call. And she said, how, how, where do I start? What do I do? And I said, well, let's meet tonight after church because we had choir practice. I don't know if y'all do that. Y'all have choir practice after church on Wednesday night. And I said, this is a good time. I counsel and you can come. And, and um, as she's walking in the door, I didn't know this either. Her daddy and mama worked in our church library and they were walking out of the door. And they met. You talk about snot and tears and slobber. And me, I was the worst. And we, we got in. I said, well, come to my office. And they, we all got there. She told the story, what had happened. What had happened to that boy? She's tell, telling all of us. She said, well, what do I do? Where do I start? I said, well, you started right here. And she, when she told some ladies in the church and I stood and told our church family, they embraced her as a long-lost sister. They, so, they, so, they, they had a baby shower. I mean, they did everything. They just loved that girl. And I said, well, Henry, this is so good. Now, um, you can get back serving as a deacon. He said, no, I really can't, Brother Tom. I said, you know, I'm going to quit praying for you, Henry. Um, 
I said, so why not? He said, well, he said, that promise is all my children will be like olive plants. Olive plants need nurture. He's down in McAllister Penitentiary, and I'm going to have to go down there every Sunday and nurture my olive plant. Well, I didn't have much to say about that. I <laughs> sounded pretty spiritual to me. And so he, he, uh, he started doing that and sort of disappeared from our circle for a while. One day I ran into him in church and I said, hey, Henry, I was almost right there. How, how's all that going? And he reached in his pocket. It was a week or so after Thanksgiving. He pulled out a photograph. It was like a Norman Rockwell photograph. I mean, it had a turkey in the middle of the table and all this kind of stuff. And there are all these people around the table. I said, who's that? And he said, that's him. He's out. There's the baby. There's Donna. Preacher, don't you understand? All my children are like olive plants around my table. Settle it now. Because tomorrow, when the sun comes up, you may discover that God has answered your prayer. Now, let me just say one more thing this morning. Settle it now. Why? Because here's the truth about tomorrow. Some of you in this room, this is the truth, are going to discover that God's given you one more day of grace. Now, that's what happened to, to Lot. These guys drug him out of the city. Up, oh, take your wife. Your two daughters are here. You'll be swept away in the punishment of the city. He hesitated. I mean, he's not even cooperating. But the men seized his hand, the hand of his wife, the hands of the two daughters, for the compassion of the Lord was upon him. And it may be on you. He may give you one more day. And they brought him out and put him outside the city. Now, Just in case that's what you've been banking on. And you're saying, well, this morning that altar is not for me. I don't have to settle at night and now because tomorrow I may have one more day of grace. Well, let me just ask you two questions. The first question is this. How do you know that this is not that one more day of grace that God is giving you? You can't stand there flat-footed and shake your fist in the face of God and say, you owe me two more days, or you owe me three more days, or five more days, or another year, or two more years. No, this could be it. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. That's right out of the Bible. How do you know this is not that day? Who in this room can say God owes me more? But there's a, there's a second question that to me is, shakes me up when I think about delaying, putting it off, and saying, well, that altar's not for me. I don't need to settle it today. What, what makes you think that turning from God today will make it more likely that you will turn to him tomorrow? How, how does practicing delay make it more possible that you're going to be prompt? How, how does practicing disobedience make it more likely that you're going to be an obedient person. Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. I, um, Diane and I were talking about this. You need to give her a lot of encouragement because she has to listen to me. But I was telling her that one day in my service with our wonderful International Mission Board, I, I had a missionary, someone who lives in this state, in fact, who, who asked me, he said, um, we were in Tanzania, 
And he said, Brother Tom, up on top of that mountain there a, that we could see, he said, way up there, he said, uh, uh, there's a village, and it's, it's a large village, and we've never been up there. There's been no church planted there. There's no, it's, it's just so hard to get to. We've never been up there. And he said, would you be willing to go with me, get my Land Rover, and we'll, we'll bash through all this stuff. We'll get up the side of that mountain as far as we can go. Hopefully, we can get to the village, and you can share the gospel. And I said, I'd love to do that. That's my life. So we got in the Land Rover and got food, and his wife prepared stuff for us, and, and we took off. And sure enough, I mean, just, I, I, I literally came back with a callus on my hand where I was hanging on to the outside mirror. And we, we hit so many bumps that it wore a callus on my hand. Bang, bang. Finally, we got up there, and there weren't just a few hundred people. I mean, th this was a, hu there was a huge group of people, and they were, it was party time. I hadn't seen anything like this. I mean, million, it just, just, you know, so we did, we did what we knew to do. We went to the chief, and we asked the chief, it wasn't a village, I mean, like I say, several hundred people there, and we asked the chief if we could, uh, if, if we could show a video and talk to the people, and he said, yeah, or a movie. And so we set up our projector, and we set up a screen which attracted everybody like moths to a candle, and we showed a picture about Jesus. And in the middle of that, uh, we, we took a break, and I stood up, and I, I shared through an interpreter as clearly as I know how, as, as simply as I know how, how people could repent of sin and trust Jesus. And we had already been told about the wickedness in that area. I gave an invitation. Not one person received Christ. Only time I have ever preached the gospel on the continent of Africa, and I lived there for a time. Only time I've ever preached the gospel, called for people to trust Christ, and no one responded. No one. They're busy having fun. I tried to make it more clear. No one. I said, well, we'll meet over here. No one. Yeah, we packed up our stuff, dejection, got in the, in the Jeep and headed down. I knew that night we weren't going to get home till way late if we even got there that night. We went crashing through the grass and everything, heading back to his house. It was real quiet. And he said, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, I must really be sad because nobody trusted Jesus. I said, well, yeah, that's exactly what I'm thinking because I am. He also said, then, you've got to be asking this question, then what keeps him here? And he said, I want to tell you that I am living here and not someplace else out of sheer obedience to the Lord who called me here to share the gospel. He didn't call me here to make decisions. I pray people will. But he called me here to share the gospel. It's up to God how he uses that. Got real silence. He said, God may even choose one day to use tonight in their judgment. Whew. They might say, but, but we never had it. And he will remind them of those two people who set foot in their village and told them 
about Jesus. He said, that's God's business, not mine. I can't bring conviction to your heart. That's his business, not mine. But I want to urge you to settle it now. Because the truth about tomorrow is that there'll be some for whom today will have been their last day of grace. Settle it now. Right now, settle it. Some of you will discover God answers your prayers. Settle it. Some may discover that God will give you another day of grace, but how do you know this is not it? And what makes you so sure that saying no to him today is going to make it more likely you'll say yes to him tomorrow? Settle it now. Would you stand with me? Our heads are bowed. Why don't you just start coming? Just let's, let's pray in a spirit of prayer. If you just say, Lord, I'm saying yes to you right now, that's it. Just get out of that aisle. Come down here, and the preacher will be down here. And if what it is is to trust Jesus as your Savior, then tell the preacher and somebody else, just come on right now. Folks are coming. I'm going to settle it. I'm going to settle it right now. And as the music plays and as folks are coming, would you join them? And say this morning, right now, Father in heaven, I pray that your Holy Spirit would just rest upon us. So many people raise their hand to say there is an unresolved issue. They've heard your word, settle it now. Lord, I'm like an attorney arguing a case before a jury. I'm arguing for a verdict. And Father, I pray that people would settle it now. And I pray it in Jesus' name. As our musician sings, you come and join these others who are already at the altar. You just kneel here with them. Pray with them. Turn to somebody and say, I'll go with you. But let's settle it now. Amen. Bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my Oh God, how I need you. Where sin runs deep, your grace is more. Where grace is found is where you are and where you Christ in me Lord I need you oh I need you every hour I need you my one defense you're my righteousness God, how I need you. Amen. Amen. Thank you for being here this morning and for uh, being open to the Lord. You see, there's others that are praying now, but I want you to know that uh, if you're a guest here, Mike and Kim, where's Mike and Kim? They're somewhere. They're out in the, right out those doors. And uh, we have a gift. We would love, love for you to receive this gift that we have for you. And it's expression of our uh, appreciation for you coming today. We want you to feel welcome and at home here if you're a guest. Uh, Brother Tom and Diane, we thank you for being here. 
And uh, we know that God orchestrated this for you to be here. There's no question in my mind that it was, it was uh, God's plan. And Brother Eddie and your family, God bless y'all uh, being here and sharing your testimony with us. And I'm praying, Brother Eddie, that God is going to use your testimony today to draw others uh, to give their testimony. If you've never been baptized, you, you, that's, that's an act of obedience that you can give uh, that will not just bless you, but it'll bless the church. It'll bless your family. It'll bless your friends uh, when they see that you're serious and Christ has made a difference in your life. Uh, I'm going to have a prayer here because it's going to be busy over there. And uh, there's chili, and I know you don't want to wait on me to get over there because I might get hung up. But uh, guests right out here, and Brother uh, Mike and Kim will help you find a short route to the chili. More important, the cobbler that's there. And uh, uh, we want you to celebrate with us. We want you to stay and enjoy this meal with us. It's going to be a wonderful time of fellowship uh, around the tables together. And we've been looking forward to this for a long time. So thank you for being here again. And uh, I'm going to pray over you and over the meal. Lord, we are grateful for what uh, our hearts have experienced today. Lord, for uh, those of us who have sought and found your will today, God, we, we thank you for that. Uh, we trust you, Lord, that your plan will be full, uh, come to, to full fruition in our lives. And uh, we can count on it that that your promises are, are uh, yes and amen. And we thank you for that. And we thank you for Tom and Diane for their being here with us on this weekend. And Lord, I pray you would watch over them and uh, direct them, Lord, uh, that you might continue to use them in churches like ours across this country. Lord, I, I ask that you would bless the, the, the food and the fellowship that we're about to enjoy together. Uh, Lord, uh, what, a, what a privilege it is for a church to be able to hang out after church and just spend some time and get to know one another a little bit better and enjoying a, a wonderful meal together. Lord, I thank you for all those who have made the food, prepared that, Lord, for us to have this great uh, uh, time together, fellowship. Lord, I pray you would bless it, bless all the fellowship, bless the food. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us online today. We are so glad that you were a part of the service. If you have any questions about what it means to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, about baptism, or how to join our family at Central Baptist Church, we would love to answer your questions. You can use Facebook Messenger to send us a message, or you can call or email the church. You will find our phone and email information on our website. Thank you again for worshiping with us today, and may God bless you and give you peace.